Welcome back to Proxy Hammer, everybody. And today we're going to be looking at the Craftworld Eldar Shroud Runners and how they're performing in Arcs of Omen. And I have to say, I've used them for quite a few games now, and as far as their effectiveness goes, I think they borderline on OP, honestly. And the reason why I say that is because their cost is amazing. They recently got reduced to 30 points per model. And when you combine that with the improved behind enemy lines secondary objective, these guys are starting to look really good, especially with the increased amount of fast attack slots that we can take, which means we can take multiple small units of these guys and they could just be all over the place every turn. And in addition to that, they're also very solid as a large unit. So they're one of the few Eldar units that can actually perform well as a small unit and large unit, respectively. Because as you guys probably know, most Eldar units operate the best as either a small or a large unit, and oftentimes not both. So Shroud Runners are a pretty good exception to that rule. And they're also really great for any kinds of buffs you want to put on them. They're pretty flexible with it. They love defensive buffs. They love offensive buffs. They're just a great unit overall, and I think, honestly, one of the best in the entire codex. So before we get into it, let's look at a quick overview of this video. We're going to be looking at the stats, weapons, and special rules of the Shroud Runners. We're going to be looking at which craft rolls Shroud Runners work best with. We're going to be looking at two powerful ways to build your Shroud Runner units. And lastly, I'm going to show you guys a cool Shroud Runner trick that can get you a lot of leverage early on in the game. So looking at the Shroud Runner's base stat line, they're 30 points a model. They're extremely fast, just like all jet bikes in our army. And they also have a really good ballistic skill. So this kind of puts them above and beyond regular Wind Riders because they do actually have ballistic skill 2+. plus which means that they hit very effectively and they're very accurate. As for their defensive stats, they're actually decently tough. Now, Toughness 4 is pretty good for Eldar, but they also have 3 wounds and a 4 plus save. So that might not seem like a lot, but that extra wound actually puts them out of range of a lot of different types of enemy weapons. Damage 2 weapons are less effective against these guys because of that extra wound on their profile. And on top of that, they are going to get a better save when in cover because of their Ranger Cloak, which we'll get into in just a second. As for their weapons, they have the Ranger Long Rifle, which is fantastic for picking off characters or other hard targets as it deals mortal wounds on wound rolls of a 6, which if you do need it, you could use a Strand of Fate for, so it has some good synergy with that. The Scatter Laser is also great for taking out lighter infantry, and with the right buffs and debuffs, you can put damage on heavier infantry as well, especially with the volume that you can take with these guys. And the pistol may seem like just like kind of like a meme. It's kind of just a cool thing to have for the model kit, but it actually allows the unit to shoot heavy weapons while advancing in Swift Strikes lists. So although you're probably never going to use it in combat, it is useful in a couple of different situations for Swift Strikes. As for their special rules, they always advance 6 inches like all jet bikes, and they get an additional plus 1 to their save when benefiting from cover, and can benefit from light cover as if infantry. So that ability is really good when combined with things like conceal, because it means they get 2 plus, not just 1 plus, to their save when out in the open and they don't normally benefit from cover. Which is actually a really big survivability boost. It will bring them basically from a 4 plus to a 2 plus which is a pretty good boost in survivability especially when considering they have three wounds and of course toughness four they also have the swift scouts ability which allows them to get a free normal move in the beginning of the game so the start of the first battle round basically a pre-game move they can also target an enemy unit within 12 inches and that unit does not benefit from cover against any kind of outcast sniper weapons so Ranger Long Rifles or the Voidbringer won't be able to benefit from any kind of cover when you use this. So just to clarify though, it only works for the Ranger Long Rifle and the Voidbringer. It does not work for any other weapon. So unfortunately, you're not going to be able to use this to ignore cover with your scatter lasers or anything like that. It only really works for Ranger Long Rifles. But it's still something you might use once in a while to, you know, get rid of an additional armor that a special character has or something like that that you're wanting to kill. It's just not something you're going to use all the time. 
Now, on the other hand, the Wire Reef Grenade Stratagem is something you're pretty much going to use every single game with these guys because it is just so good. So first of all, it reduces either an enemy's movement or charge distance, whichever phase you use it in. So you can use it in the enemy movement phase or the enemy charge phase. And it reduces D3 inches of their movement or D3 inches of their charge regardless. Also, it does D3 mortal wounds as well. So it's great for denying movement and charges. And if you put these guys kind of in front of the enemy army and you use this ability, you can block up a lot of enemy units from being able to do what they wanted to do that turn. So it's really quite awesome for that. And also the reason why it's really effective is because you're never not going to be able to use it. Because you can proc it in the enemy movement phase, there's going to be pretty much no chance for your opponent to be able to kill your unit of shroud runners before it actually gets to use this. So yes, you can use it in the charge phase, but if you're afraid that your unit is gonna get shot off the table before that point, you can always use it in the movement phase instead. So which craft worlds do shroud runners work best with? So I think they pretty much work best in any craft world, to be honest with you, at least a small unit of them for scoring on things like behind enemy lines. But I do think specifically they run the best with the Uthway craft world, the Alayta Craft World, of course, and Swift Strikes. So in the Uthway Craft World, you have very strong psychic powers for buffs and a very defensive play style, which really kind of melds well and meshes well with the Shroud Runners. And you also have traits that synergize well to make them tougher against mortal wounds and really high AP. And remember, if you want to stack buffs on Shroud Runners, there's no better Craft World to do it with than with Uthway, because you have a much better chance of succeeding with those protects and those conceals and honestly in my recent Uthway lists i've actually been running a lot of shroud runners in them just for this reason because they're so easy to stack buffs on with Uthway. they're very defensive they are great at holding objectives in the late game with basically a one plus armor save and of course the five plus ignores mortal wounds as well as if you do cast fortune on them as well they get just a five plus ignores wounds ability so very strong with Uthway and honestly a very solid choice in pretty much any Uthway list whether you're running them as a unit of five or as a unit of three or even both <laughs> i know in my list that i've been running with Uthway recently i've been running them as a squad of three and as a squad of five in the same list and they've been very effective and then of course we have the alay talk so the alay talk is really good with these guys not exactly for their you know psychic powers or anything like that but for the fact that their craft world traits synergize extremely well with them, giving them light cover permanently as well as dense cover within terrain. So arguably, you can actually get them to be even more tanky than you could in an Uthway list. The only thing is they do have to be in terrain to get that extra tankiness. And Alay Talk lists as well tend to be very defensive and very effective at misdirecting enemy units and preventing enemy units from getting to where they want to go so using a lot of movement slowing abilities using a lot of diversion blocking stuff like that a lay talk is very effective at that and they play very well into that now of course a lay talk tends to be one of the weaker craft worlds now unfortunately because of the fact that so many of the new armies that came out just ignore cover or just really don't care about cover too much right especially armies that like to get up close and personal but I do think Alay Talk is still very solid, and I am going to do a video on them eventually. I do want to start kind of getting back into Alay Talk. I think they're a really cool faction, but Shroud Runners work really well with them in a number of ways. And then, of course, we have Swift Strikes. So Swift Strikes is, I think, one of those stronger types of lists nowadays, especially with Shroud Runners. I mean, they can get so many movement cheats with this craft world trait so they can move 16 inches advance six inches and then battle focus another d6 on top of that and this basically allows them to be in the enemy deployment zone whenever they want to and if your opponent is hiding a unit behind obscuring terrain you often will still have enough movement to be able to see and get to that unit shoot it and do some damage at the same time as scoring on objectives so in Swift Strikes lists, they are extremely strong, very versatile with how much objective control and damage they can do to units that they would normally not be able to deal damage to. 
So I'm going to go ahead and show you two powerful ways to run shroud runners, and neither of them are the wrong way to run them. I think they're both very powerful ways to run them, and that is the Swift Scouts and the Shrouded Artillery. So the Swift Scouts is a minimum unit of three for 90 points. This unit is great at scoring from turn one, especially with Swift Strikes, on behind enemy lines. So behind enemy lines is one of those objectives that I think has replaced the hidden path in a lot of defensive style lists for a lot of Eldar players and in a lot of lists in general because it's so strong. You get three points just for having one unit in the enemy deployment zone, which is very easy to do as Craft World Eldar. And this unit can also be used in a number of ways. It can hang back and just deal damage over the course of a game. Or you can use it as a screening unit. Because of their reduced points cost, their large bases can also be used to block movement and charge lanes for opponents, and they can also, on top of that, slow enemy units down with the wire weave grenade stratagem. And a unit of three is pretty easy to hide and just wait for the right opportunity. So just like a viper, these guys can basically just sit out of line of sight until your enemy moves something up that is threatening your lines. And you can obviously move these guys forward, deal a mortal wound or some mortal wound to that opponent, and also be able to block them from getting to where they are. And not for nothing, at the same time, these guys could also just shoot things pretty effectively, right? They do have three scatter lasers and three ranger long rifles that, while aren't the most powerful weapons against a lot of opponents, do some really reliable chip damage against heavier targets, and against lighter targets can do some massive damage. Scatter lasers are really effective against things like Imperial Guardsmen, Demon Units, and stuff like that. And then for our next build, we have the Shrouded Artillery. So this is a large unit of five at 150 points. And this is a great unit for offensive and defensive buffs alike, especially when stacked, it can make the unit very hard to kill. So just to give you a quick example, something I gave you earlier was in an Uthway list or pretty much any list, if you have Fortune, Protect, and Conceal, you can get these guys up to a one plus armor save and a five plus feel no pain, even in the open, right? Which is extremely effective. It can make the unit extremely hard to kill, especially since they do have three wounds apiece and they're also toughness four, which again, isn't really that tough, but it is quite a bit tougher when you're staring down anti-infantry fire, most of which is going to be strength four. So it is going to make a mathematical difference there. They also deal fantastic range damage with their scatter lasers and ranger long rifles they hit on a two plus their ranger long rifles can cause mortal wounds and they just have a lot of weapons per platform which makes them hit extremely hard for their cost i mean again these guys are only 30 points a model so they're really cost effective now the only downside to these guys is they are a bit harder to hide but they shouldn't be too hard to hide with the correct terrain setup so again Normal boards will have at least four pieces of pretty large obscuring terrain, which should be easy for them to hide behind. And in addition to that, your board should be filled with other types of terrain as well, line of sight blocking terrain and things. So you really shouldn't have a hard time hiding them on the correct terrain setup. And honestly, even for those of you who are playing on really terrain light boards and just have no terrain for whatever reason, right? Let's say your local group just doesn't have a lot of terrain or whatever. If you stack defensive buffs on these guys every turn, they're getting a 1 plus armor save and they're getting a 5 plus feel no pain. Not a lot of enemy units are going to want to shoot into that without some sort of, you know, massive concentration of fire. And you guys, you know, can obviously keep these guys far back enough to be safe from that as well. So if you're worried about that, you know, not having a lot of terrain on the board, there are ways of making this unit good even without terrain. Although I highly... <laughs> I can't say this enough. I highly discourage players from accepting low terrain style boards if they're playing Craft World Eldar or any army for that matter. And that's honestly one of the things I hope GW does in the future is they basically require players to have a certain amount of terrain on the board to be able to play a game at Warhammer 40k because it's just really difficult to play without it as this faction. All right, off on a little bit of a tangent there, but I did want to show you a cool Shroud Runner trick that I think can help you guys score a lot of points and basically set the pace of the game in a lot of your matches. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. I'm going to show you a diagram of basically how to pull this off 
and how it's effective. So this trick involves three shroud runners. And basically what you do here is you see the enemy units deployed over there in blue, right? And this is typically how enemy units will deploy in the first turns of the game. They're going to be wanting to, for the most part, hide their most important units behind obscuring terrain. You might see a unit in some light cover on the far end of the board, something like that. But chances are your opponent is not gonna just field a bunch of stuff on the deployment line just so you can kill unless they're playing something like Imperial Guard or stuff like that, in which case, by the way, if you are facing a Horde army and they just have their whole deployment zone filled with troops and stuff like that, this tactic is not really going to work. But here's the positive side. Those three Shroud Runners are going to be able to do a lot more damage to that Horde-style army in response because they do have scatter lasers. So they are going to be effective at just staying back and clearing those models. Okay, so this is how the strategy works. So this is going to work against most armies that don't field hordes and hordes of infantry. And even then, you can probably still find some place in the board in which you can do this. So you start off first turn with your pregame move, right? And this will put you in range to score behind enemy lines on your first turn. So the unit on the left is behind obscuring terrain. To hide from your enemy units turn one which is fine because we don't really want to shoot them anyway so what we're going to do is we're going to move into a position here that blocks those enemy units from being able to go to the right hand side of the board and get a positional advantage on our side so if you notice how the terrain set up if my opponent is allowed to sweep around the right flank there they'll be able to draw a line of sight to my units behind the ruins on my side of the board and I want to delay that as much as possible so that whatever's behind those ruins, may they be D cannons, more shroud runners, war walkers, can get multiple turns to shoot at enemy units. So I use my shroud runners to basically block them off from that side. Now, this is the choices that my opponent has at this point. My opponent can either try to just destroy the shroud runners and waste a turn doing that, which is fine. He'll probably end up killing them, but I'll also score victory points on behind enemy lines and probably kill a few models in the process with the wire reef grenades and stuff like that. So he can either do that, or he can just ignore them and go around the ruin to the other side, or maybe even just try to go through the ruin. Every single one of those scenarios for my opponent is not ideal. If he goes through the ruin, of course, he's making himself vulnerable, so my units can see him. And yes, his unit will get light cover, but if I'm running something like Swift Strikes with Masterful Shots, or if I have Reveal in my army, you know, I could easily negate that bonus. If he goes around to the other side, he's completely ignoring the right flank, and he's not going to be able to shoot at my vulnerable units behind my own ruins. And if he just, again, tries to go through the Shroud Runners, he's going to be basically wasting a lot of movement so he's not going to be able to move very far that turn and again that also just plays to my advantages okay now the other way you could do it is you can move him to the other side see that piece of cover over there on the right hand side that crater you could if you want to do a safer thing maybe you're not into movement blocking you know and you don't want to just basically use your movement to block the enemy units what you can do instead is you can deploy them in a far corner of the board where not a lot of enemy units are going to be able to engage them effectively. So you move them in there, you shoot at the unit within those ruins, right? or not ruins, sorry, the crater right there, right next to them. And then you basically are forcing your opponent to deal with that unit because your opponent can't just leave them there and that unit of five in that crater is probably not going to be enough to be able to kill them which could have several long-term implications for your opponent. So your opponent not being able to deal with that unit will basically have to give you three points of behind enemy lines for several turns. Your opponent's probably not going to want to do that, so they're going to have to turn around and shoot at those Shroud Runners. However, they're Shroud Runners, so they're benefiting from light cover at this point. They're at a two-plus save, and that's going to be hard to kill for just one unit of Space Marines. So your opponent is probably going to have to shoot a significant amount of firepower at those Shroud Runners to be able to kill them. And of course, here's the other cool thing you can do. If you notice your opponent is maybe doesn't have the tools necessary to kill those Shroud Runners easily, what I like to do is I like to pop a Matchless Agility on that unit. Or excuse me, not Matchless Agility, I'm sorry, that's the wrong stratagem. 
lightning fast reflexes. So lightning fast reflexes will basically give the unit a minus one to hit buff. So that can make it really hard for your opponent to actually kill them. They have a two plus save, you know, on top of a two plus save, they have minus one to hit. It's just gonna be extremely difficult for your opponent to remove them if they don't have the right tools for it. And I've actually had scenarios where an opponent has fired two or three units at those shroud runners and they've survived, you know, and they have like two models left even. And then my opponent's looking at me and going, God, these are annoying, you know? And then he ends up having to charge them with something. And that is the best thing that can happen because if your opponent decides to charge and the charging unit is not exactly a combat unit, you're going to survive, essentially. So even if you have two Shroud Runners, a unit of three Marines charging in probably won't be able to kill them that easily, right? They hit on threes, but again, you know, you do have Toughness 4, so you are going to be wounded on fours versus threes, and you do get a four plus save base, which oftentimes will be enough to allow you to survive at least a squad of five Marines, not every army, right? I mean, if you're going against something like Grey Knights, you're going to die. If you're going against something like Custodes or something like that, your unit's probably going to be dead. But you're going to be able to cause so much disruption to the enemy army in the meantime that your 90 points of Shroud Runners are going to pay off big time. And honestly, I've used this in several games to great effect. And there's not much your opponent can do. If they're running a kind of smaller elite army, which are most of the armies out there, then they're not going to be able to screen enough space on the board to be able to stop you from simply moving into it, right? You're not deep striking, so there's no 9-inch bubble you have to worry about. You're just moving normally. And even though Shroud Runners have a large base, you only have to remain more than one inch away from enemy units, which with a unit of three is fairly easy to do. So you should be able to do that pretty much no problem. Be able to score on behind enemy lines and also cause a lot of disruption to your opponent at the same time. So in conclusion, I really do think that Shroud Runners have become a quintessential Craftworld Eldar unit that have excellent objective play and solid damage as well. And on top of that, you have three really powerful utility abilities in the form of a pregame move, which is excellent with them as they were very fast. A lot of units that have pregame moves aren't movement 16, right? They have a really powerful stratagem that not only deals mortals, but also slows enemy movement down. And not for nothing this is a underrated ability in my opinion but they have an ability that ignores cover for sniper weapons so a little bit of a debuff and a lot of people don't put much credit into it but it's actually a pretty decent ability for the late stages in a game when you really need to kill a character that's in a piece of terrain you know maybe they're on an objective and maybe a little bit of that objective is covered by a terrain piece or something like that you know or they're benefiting from cover from some or other means you have the ability to basically ignore this and take out that enemy unit. So even though it's not going to be used every single turn, obviously, it is something that is nice to have for those late stages in the game where you are going to be within 12 inches of enemy units that are in cover. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today's video. Shroud Runners are awesome. They're one of my favorite units in the Codex. I think probably my favorite unit in the Codex right now just for how much they can do in a game. And honestly... A lot of my lists have at least a unit of three in them, and probably all of my lists that I've enjoyed playing within the last month or two have included Shroud Runners. So, really great unit, can't say enough good things about them. And honestly, even when you run a lot of them, I found great success using them. So, I've used a couple of lists where I have 15 of them, and yeah, that doesn't work against every army out there, right? Because a lot of armies have ways to deal with them. If you're running too many of them, you're not going to be able to fit all of them behind obscure terrain alongside of things like D cannons and stuff like that. Of course, right? So that's not always going to work, but I've had great success with it anyway. I have to be real with you, especially if I'm running a lay talk. I love running three of these units because I know that they're always going to get cover saves. They're basically always going to be at a two plus, which is insane for Eldar to think about, right? You have a unit that is basically getting a two plus armor save wherever it goes because it benefits from cover and whichever unit is not behind obscuring terrain you can throw fortune and protect on it and get a one plus save not even the toughest armies in 40k can do something like that very easily and honestly it's something that would make even death guard armies very envious of it 
So yeah, Shroud Runners are a very versatile unit that can be used in a lot of ways, and I know I've said this a couple times in this video, but my absolute favorite unit in this edition. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today's video. I will see you guys next time. Leave a comment in the comment section if you have a question about Shroud Runners or basically any other Eldar topic. I love reading your guys' comments and responding when I can. And I do also have a Patreon if you do want to support the channel a little bit further. I will leave the link in the description for you guys. And yeah, anyway, thanks for supporting everybody. And I just want to give a special shout out to those who have supported me on Patreon and through other means. Thank you so much. It's been a really big help. I actually almost have enough now to buy some new recording equipment, things like that, to make the quality of the videos a little bit better. So I'm really grateful to you guys. And thank you for doing what you guys do. And being the absolute best community in 40k. And I stand by that 100%. I think we are the best community in 40k. I think Eldar players are super creative, super open-minded with trying new things. And overall, I really think that, you know, we have a really strong and fantastic community. Now, if only we could get GW to realize that so they can actually put out new plastic kits for the Eldar, I think we'd be all right. Going along with that, I do want to make a quick announcement as well. I am going to be doing a video on basically a create your own aspect showcase for the community. So just like we had that bad list contest way back, I want to open up a kind of another contest where you guys submit a idea for an aspect warrior that hasn't already been done, obviously, and basically make the rules for it, create the special rules, create their stats and everything. And I want to do a showcase about the top five submissions that I get for the community. And my hope is, is that hopefully I can take that and, you know, I know it might not do anything to be honest with you, but I can submit that video to GW and say, hey, look at, you know, what the Craft World Eldar community came up with for new Aspect Warrior units, you know. And maybe if we're lucky, they'll even do some, you know, you know, bullshit article or something like that, putting it on their community website and you know maybe we can get some <laughs> maybe we can get some attraction or you know stuff like that i don't know <laughs> we'll see but yeah all right everybody that's going to be it for today i will see you guys next time peace out and have a good one everybody see you later